perhaps uh, stigma is a big part of it too. And stigma? It's, yes. I think training and the quantification that was raised earlier is really important. But not just the training of the healthcare professionals, um, but also the training of the general public and patients. Because I think a, a lot of us do not actually understand the importance of presenting and admitting that we have pain and the stigma of being seen as weak and malingering, and uh, the disease area perhaps I know best is one I suffer from myself, which is very severe migraine. And the chronic migraine is 15 days per month, which is half your life. Um, and uh, to actually present to a doctor and say, help me. Um, and if you're trying to maintain your career, you're trying to maintain a family and trying to have a life, and you're perceived as just a headache. Um, I think that crosses the board in so many disease areas that if we, and I know other people are going to speak earlier about early diagnosis, early presentation, early treatment to prevent the chronification. So I quite like the idea of the quantification idea, but I would like to see us address areas of stigma and education of health professionals and the general public. Of course, we can't quantify unless patients report that they have a problem, and you're saying many don't. No. And, and, and with migraine, normally one can resolve this with serotonin reuptake inhibitors and all sorts of things like that. One assumes, but you're saying no. There are many patients with migraine for whom these things just don't work. I, I think in fairness, because it's the, there are other brain disorders that um, I am very familiar with, but it's the one I know best. In fairness, I think people feel that there's nothing they can do, and you talked about the um, new treatments. It's lifestyle issues as well, um, and you probably know by my accent that I'm from Ireland. I'm an Irish woman who doesn't drink, because if I did, I would have migraine. So it's learning to take power to take management, self-management, and I'm sure there isn't anybody in this room who hasn't had to take ownership and in a self-management, self-supported management way to identify, to take control of your life and hopefully maybe manage the expectation and I think this is one of the areas that politicians are quite interested in. I had a meeting last week with our Minister for Health, and when I said to him, look, if we learn to manage our disorders, what can you do to give us the services so that we access them appropriately at the right time, in the right place, and with somebody who's properly trained? And that's a whole scenario, I hope, by the end of today, that we'll have a roadmap for. Merton, you've in a way got a bit of a road map in Dorset in the south of, of England uh, and that very much involves the patient in the way that Audrey was, was talking about there. Just explain it to us, what, what, you've, what you've developed, the pathway that you've created there. Nick, I think I'd like to start by saying that I'm very fortunate to work with a number of people who are absolute stalwarts and soldiers living with pain for every day of their lives. So for me, it's an absolute privilege to hear their stories and really inspiring to learn from each and every one of those people. And if I may, for a second, just open it up to the audience and ask how many people here actually live with pain virtually on a daily basis? Could we, with Nick's permission, have a show of hands? Right. Right. And was it easy coming all the way here to Brussels for this conference? <laughs> Absolutely. And how many of you live with people who live with pain? Carers? Absolutely. And how many of you work with people who work, who, who live with pain? Fantastic. So we already have a massively committed audience here. So I know that whatever I'm saying, I'm saying to the converted already. So our patients in Dorset, you know, fantastic group of people, but kept saying to me over a 10-year period that, you know, Mayors and your service is fine, but you're just coming in too late for us. So by the time they came to see me, and the long, longest-standing punter came after, I think, 37 years of having been in pain. 37 years? Without any treatment of the pain itself? Of, for the pain itself in terms of secondary care. So I began thinking and lobbied lots of clinicians and lots of commissioners and you know, said, please, can we have some money to put, put our services earlier in the sequence of patients' journeys? No response. 
And then finally, I think it was 2010, the Health Foundation gave us a grant for innovation in healthcare. And their first question to me was, how come early intervention in pain hasn't been trialled yet? And my response was, exactly, how come? Because we've got the expertise, we know what to do with chronic pain, but what we're doing is calling it chronic pain and working with chronic pain. Whereas I think what we need to do is get the word chronic out of the equation. As long as we think of it as treating chronic pain, we will always come in too late. But if we start thinking about pain, if someone here had a heart attack, would we actually say, come back in two months and we'll treat you, you know, whenever you want to? Come, come back, come, come and have a chat in two months, you know? Why are we doing that with pain? Why are we coming in so late? That was a question my patients asked me again and again. So we changed our model. We put, our, we put the cart before the horse, or the other way around now, and we actually started coming in much earlier. We asked GPs to refer to us within two years of their first episode and found nobody because GPs weren't used to referring people that early in the patient's journeys to pain clinics. So we widened it, we said within two years of the existing episode, and we got 80 referrals within a, in a county of 700,000 people. And we chose 30 of them, ran a model, and the model had early intervention, which consisted of proper triage at the point of entry. So we assessed people for psychosocial com comorbidities. So if they actually had psychosocial issues, we worked with those before bringing them into the pain management pathway. And then people also had a lot of help in terms of self-help. So we designed our pain chain, which is the AA model of each person living with pain, helping another person who lives with pain. Because even if you were to clone us 100 times over, all of us here, we'd never have enough people to help, you know, 500 million people in Europe living with, or was it 100 million? 100 million, thank you, slightly better, living with pain. Yeah. So th that's fascinating, the, the, uh, the idea of, of, of self-help. I'm it, it, intrigued that though you use the parallel of heart attacks if somebody here had a heart attack, we wouldn't say, well, we'll treat you in a few days' time or a few weeks' time. But, of course, we did do that with stroke. We didn't think of early intervention in stroke, and we've now realised the error of our ways. Unless we get in immediately, we have serious, chronic, long-term problems. And maybe we've just got to use parallels like that for pain. If you don't get in early, then you're going to have a real tale of problems all, all, all the way through this. Jamie, we were talking about um, resource. You plainly, I mean, you've got some, an innovation fund, Mahertzen. Um It's going to be very, very difficult in, in this environment, financial environment, to get more resource into this, isn't it? Well, I, David alluded to, it, alluded to it earlier in the previous panel, is we can't really afford to ignore it. In, we were just speaking about early diagnosis then, and that's a key issue, because once you become chronic, in a lot of cases, the ship sailed. And in, there's a study across Europe that shows nearly half of all patients are not diagnosed within the first year, and that's a huge issue. And then 72% of those patients, are then, their work life is then affected, and 42% are then unable to go back to work. That is a huge huge burden to the whole system and we were talking before it's between three and ten percent the burden well a really good study in sweden shows that and it's not a pie in the sky study because you were talking before about how the evidence is quite disparate how it's based on small samples of people lots of heterogeneity well this is based on 840,000 people within sweden where they've coded it and they take account for things properly in terms of, uh, I see them as a leader, they look at things from the societal perspective, so they do take into consideration the lost work, they do take into consideration the caregiver burden associated with that patient's condition. And of those 840,000 people in the, in the study that they conducted, it accounts for 10% of the whole GDP lost in Sweden. Yes, that's based on some opportunity cost, but we must look at that as well. So 10% of the whole economy is gone due to chronic pain. One of the problems, also for politicians and policymakers, though, is that we don't live in this transparent world where whichever my ministry is, I'm happy to pay money to help out your ministry. And so I've, we've all come across this in the past. You, you raise a global issue of gross domestic product and the loss to the economy... And then you're going to a specific department and saying, well, we want you to invest your money to save his or her money over there. Just explain 
what do you think are the, the best ways we can break down the barriers in, among policymakers to get th this whole issue taken more seriously? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a difficult issue, especially in the political reality of today, because five years on the crisis and uh, after the 2014 European elections, now we see a totally different political landscape in Europe than we've ever seen before. And uh, it, the current commission uh, with President Juncker is an actually much stronger political commission that we've had before, but they also have a much uh, narrower mandate. It seems that their sole mandate is to focus on job rich recovery, in, on inclusive recovery, but uh, definitely on addressing the problems caused by the financial and the economic crisis. And this is not to say that we need to talk about money from here on, because uh, when we talk about chronic pain, we have to remember that we talk about people and we talk about people who suffer. But when we want to get an issue on the political agenda, we have to realize what are the current priorities on the political agenda, and it's actually growth and jobs. So the, the work done by, by Jamie and colleagues working on the quantification on these issues and looking into very strong economic arguments like 10% of the GDP or 20% of people with chronic pain losing their jobs, um, that can be a very powerful argument to, to be able to step on the scene uh, with the current political uh, priorities. Another very important uh, hook for uh, the chronic pain agenda is the focus on uh, healthcare workers because um, we are in Europe we are looking to create more and more jobs and we also see that uh, in healthcare there will be a very strong demand for healthcare workers so that's an important opportunity for uh, employing a good number of people now there are a lot of reasons why these jobs are not filled at the moment and why we pr forecast uh, some serious gaps between uh, the available health professionals and the, and the future demand for uh, care. But uh, the Commission is working on a number of initiatives, horizon scanning activities to uh, estimate the future demand for, for health care. We also look into training and uh, new skills for new care areas into long-term care and into more uh, multi-professional um, care provision. So these are again very related and important uh, points on the agenda that uh, would be interesting for the chronic pain colleagues to look into. Let me try and get some contributions from, from the floor, please. Of, of, we're looking now for solutions. Uh, as I say, we, enough talk. How do we break down the barriers? One of the ones which has just been articulated by Ossie, we've got to bear in mind we're not going to get a magic wand out of politicians because they don't have a magic wand. There is a danger of Europe settling back into a double recession. There is the danger of nationalism rising, even in very pro-European countries uh, like, like France, where Le Pen and, and others are, are, let alone in countries like the United Kingdom and Denmark. So we, we don't have a very pro propitious circumstance to get global European policies or global European money. What else can we do? Who, who, who wants to contribute about what you, what's burning you, what you would like to see done? Yes, please. Sorry, it's very difficult for us to see against the lights, but we'll get a microphone it, to you. It's more a comment about the growth in healthcare workers, because when it's applied to a national level, we're just seeing our healthcare workers uh, losing their jobs, uh, being made redundant everywhere. And it's a huge cutbacks. And uh, so I don't see how this tallies with creating new jobs in Europe, in healthcare, if at a national level, quite the opposite is happening. Okay, thank you. As you say, it's a, it's a comment rather than a question. Uh, but yes, and an important one. Uh, any, anyone else, please? On, on Maybe I can answer. Sorry, yes, please, Ozzy. I, I, I can comment back on it uh, uh, quickly. Uh, with the aging of the population, we are expecting uh, a higher demand for care services. The number of people over 65 will, double, will almost double by 2050, and we expect that at that age they will need more health services. 
Also, we know that 60% uh, of the GPs and 45% of the nurses are over 45 today. So it's, it's a profession with a very unique uh, age profile. And uh, you don't need to be a hardcore economist to be able to forecast that in 10, 15 years, this will cause some uh, serious problems. Mm. So these are the, the two main factors that will contribute to a, a lack of uh, health professionals in the future. Yes, please. Someone in the, in, in the middle bank here. And if, you, if those who've got the microphones, don't wait for me. Just please take the microphone to whoever's got, got the hand up. Somebody here and somebody over there as well. Yes, please. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Snežana Bosniak from Serbia. I'm a medical oncologist working in cancer pain treatment. Uh, what I would like to see is really that cultural change. And you were talking about disease-oriented medicine. And we, I would like to see patient-oriented medicine. And here we talk about how we treat pain. And I don't think that we treat pain. We treat person and patient with a name, with a life. And uh, what I feel is that we had to name chronic pain a disease in order to get attention. Uh, and we say chronic pain is a disease on its own right. And it's not a disease. Chronic pain is suffering. And only, and we as healthcare professionals and system and regulatory authority made it a disease. So I think that we have to talk about suffering and how we as a medical profession, pro politician, everybody would like and are determined to relieve suffering of a particular person. Thank you. And there's a, somebody at the back there as well. Chris, would you like to respond to that? EFIC has uh, created a policy where you want to get much better training of proper curriculum into this. Just very briefly for those who don't know about it, just, just explain what that policy is. Well, first of all, chronic pain is a disease. It's been accepted by the European Parliament that chronic pain is a disease, but nothing's happened. That's a legislation problem. Come on, if it's been accepted, they've got to legislate for that. They've got to make it happen in all the member states. That's the first thing. Training in pain, EFIC couldn't agree more that this is essential. You heard Hans talk about our undergraduate curriculum, and yesterday we made the momentous decision that we're going to look for certification in pain amongst clinicians and hopefully roll that out to other healthcare professionals in the future. That's going to cost a lot of money, but EFIC feels that is a wonderful investment. But I don't want to lose sight of something you pointed out, which is that it's, it's about people, and there's a sort of a callousness that sometimes we see a disease and we don't see the person, we don't see the suffering. We'll pick that up, actually, in, in, in a moment. Yes, have you got a microphone? Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Chris Barker. I'm, I'm previously a GP in Liverpool, and uh, now I... Sorry, can you speak a, a bit more slowly? Sorry, I'm not used to microphone technique. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is Chris Barker. I'm, I'm previously a general practitioner in Liverpool, and, and now I... I specialise in pain. Um, I think, really, you know, following the, um, the discussions that we've had, I think predominantly we need to make people bothered about pain. I think we need to make clinicians bothered about pain because often the temptation is to kind of ignore it in favour of looking at a pathological kind of model. So I think, um, you know, trying to convince our colleagues that, uh, that that's an important factor is, is key to this. And how, um, sorry to interrupt you, how are we going to do that? I think it's um, partly cultural, as we kind of talked about this morning. But I think um, also, you know, we can highlight the importance of, uh, of pain through, you know, a number of studies. I think colleagues, they often look um, to determine how important something is by looking at impact. On, and I think we need to get our data, you know, kind of in front of, of colleagues to do that, really, in front of general practitioners and, and, and frontline specialists. But, but I think also, you know, if, if we all have our own ways or we, we all have our own theories on how we should do this, but I think, um, I, I personally think that um, the problems really, the three-pronged attack really, if we were looking at this, the time spent with patients is always very difficult for general practitioners particularly and also busy nurses, etc. We need to find some way of a quick assessment for people, uh, for clinicians to be able to do that. I think, secondly, the ability to know what to do for the best. Um, you know, patients, uh, clinicians often don't know what to do with things when they're faced with difficult problems, and that comes with education, I guess. And the third thing is having an appropriate access to services. Most of my GP colleagues will say, well, I can assess a problem, but I don't know where to refer them to. Okay. So I think we need a three-pronged attack if we're going to kind of uh, look at this in detail. Jamie, that all sounds sense to me. No, no, I think it's a really good point. Um, the issue being is that 
we, if, if we want to highlight the issues that surround pain, we need to be able to quantify them so we can develop a consensus on what the issue is and what the actual real burden is because the evidence is everywhere. What we don't do, as we do with virtually every other disease, is we don't code for it. There's only France that actually has a code for chronic pain. So we're, we're all in this room discussing our separate little um, cases and we've got stacks of papers with 20, 30, hundreds, thousands of patients in different groups, whereas with any other condition, we can just enter routinely collected data and see exactly what's going on in that, si in that system. We can't do that with pain. Audrey, and then I'm just going to go to someone at the back there. Yes, Audrey, please. I, I absolutely agree with that. I think perhaps maybe what we should do, uh, on the flight over here, I was told to put on the oxygen mask on the adult and then use it on the child with after, you, in. After you. After you can breathe. Yes. yes. OK. So maybe using that analogy, we could use the existing ones, bearing in mind the resources that are so scarce that we've heard about, and we could align ourselves to the existing very good programs in other areas and get a, a ground-up approach, because it seems to me, reading what the new commissioner is saying, um, and I hope it's going to be a reality, uh, I've already spoken to Orsi about this, I'm so encouraged by his first statement. It really is about putting people at the centre, but it's about changing how we do things. Right, well, let me just put that to Orsi. Sorry, I'll come to you just one more. Orsi, this idea of an analogy, it, it strikes me as quite an important one. You talk about this on the aeroplane. We're always told, put the oxygen on, on yourself first before anyone else. I, uh, we, we talked about heart attack analogy earlier, and actually the stroke analogy is maybe one that we can use realistically, isn't it? Because it is analogous. We, we were hopeless about treating stroke immediately. We didn't realise the chronic consequences of late intervention. Can we not use this? Would that be powerful? Would that be effective? I think th doing the same uh, sort of studies and the same sort of assessment to look into the costs of uh, chronic pain, also taking a broader societal perspective, the person losing its job, the person losing its place in the society, saying how much it actually costs to make a comprehensive, multidisciplinary pain intervention, and then putting the two costs together, saying that this person would lose its job and would be on unemployment benefits, costing the state 100 euros a year, whereas the cost of the pain treatment is 50 euros a year. What a brilliant investment for everybody. Um, that could be the sort of evidence and the sort of quantification uh, that could underline uh, these interventions. Of course, the figures I was just saying were completely arbitrary, but uh, I would expect that the cost of even a very comprehensive pain intervention would be much less than uh, paying the, the uh, insurance and the sickness benefit to a people who is unable to work and who is suffering because of the, of the constant pain that he is experiencing. Jamie, may, maybe you and David and others can actually make that parallel in figures. It worked for stroke treatment, maybe we can make it work for pain treatment on the same basis. And there's pilot studies that suggest that multidisciplinary team-based intervention is cost-effective anyway, so there's, there is evidence out there. It's just... it's the understanding, the availability of the information. So even as in, in Mertzen's example, you might need pump priming, you might need some innovation money to get it going, but once you've got it going, is it actually, is it expensive what you're doing? Not at all. And if you compare it for the costs of, you know, regular medication which people take and interventions and surgery, it's absolutely cost effective. Okay. Dennis Martin from Teesside University in England. I think I would just like to make the case and hope that we would hear some discussion about self-management. Not self-management as in go away, um, there's nothing more we can do with you, um, you're on your own, but um, structured support for self-management, training, um, direction to available resources, access to those resources, and perhaps some skills training in undergraduate education as to how to help people with self-management. Thank you. Chris, I, sorry, you wanted to come on that, Mohurtson. I just find this very exciting and very encouraging 
because I had expected that the main answer here was going to be we had to persuade people to provide billions more euros across Europe for this, which would have been a very hard sell. But actually, what we're saying is there are lots of things we can do, and we can do it with minimal costs, at least financial costs at the beginning. Chris? Absolutely. We were going to talk about innovations, and 32 years ago, I went to Seattle, which was the mecca of pain medicine, and I met Bill Fordyce, a psychologist, who explained to me that 15% of the cost of an American stamp went to the postman with disability, because the post office had to pay them for the, carrying the heavy sacks. And he told me about the program he'd started with Boeing, where people with back pain who went off sick were actively managed by Boeing and by nurses and OTs, which got them back to work twice as fast and reduced disability to a half. The cost that Boeing spent was tenfold recovered by the l less money that they had to pay out. So that was something that was obviously cost effective. It's not new, it's 32 years old. I came back and started a pain management program in the UK. It's not new, it's 30 years old. We have these things, but where is the legislation to make industry do that? That, would, that wouldn't cost governments any money, and it would save industry money in the long term. So that would be a really, really good thing to do. I don't know any businessman who would say, I want more legislation, Chris. It That's, saves him money. Well, maybe, but they'll want to do that themselves. And it is difficult for politicians because they are caught in this. We're heading for recession. Business community says, for heaven's sake, we don't want any more red tape. We don't want more. Um, it, politicians are in a very difficult spot on this. Uh, John, yes, can I just see how many other people would like to, to take part? One... Just, just add two more and somebody right at the back. Yes, please. Uh, back pain, uh, Chris, is, uh, is a major problem, isn't it? And it, it causes more disability than anything else, more uh, chronic pain. Um, Keele have done an awful lot of work with that. Keele? Uh, Keele, Keele University? Keele University. And they actually have the Keele Start Back, a very simple tool that GPs and, and secondary care can use so that you actually can uh, stratify patients into uh, low, high, and, uh, and, and medium risk. Uh, so that the high ones get uh, sent to triage nurses. Uh, and in fact, if we actually look at that program, we would actually solve a lot of our, uh, 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 the problems that are normally created. And it's all there. It just needs us to actually activate these systems. Uh, my name is Job Vigrinfen. I'm president of Pain Alliance Europe. Um, I was wondering, if you are looking for solutions, um, wouldn't it be the best solution of working together? healthcare professionals, patients associations, and not just the pain and, and the pain patients, but more broader coalitions. Because we're talking about chronic diseases, and a lot of chronic diseases have the same issues on hand. So it's not what Neil said, that on one hour there's the Parkinson's, and the other hour comes the migraine, and then comes the heart attacks, but one person comes in the door of the minister and asks, can you do something on the, all the issues on chronic diseases? And then you get a platform, and then you can work on your own. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, at the back, someone's got the microphone. OK, um, my name is Robert Johnston. You probably can't see me because I'm sitting in a wheelchair behind a guy who's a bit taller than me. Uh, I represent the International Alliance of Patients Organizations and also the European Patients Forum. And I'm just following on very logically from what's been said. Yes, we do need alliances. We do need people with pain to work with other chronic conditions. We need a broader patient alliance across Europe and across the world. Um, we, we need to raise, I think, expectations amongst people with chronic pain that they don't have to live with the pain. And we need to empower those people to lobby for themselves because it's great that we've got the people getting the statistics together to prove the burden of pain and the relative cost interventions to improve it. But unless you get the people living with the condition, going forward, promoting the issues, you don't personalize it. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not saying anything new. Everybody's already said these things. I'm just putting a few of them together. And that's when you're likely to get the change. And to appeal to those who are in terms of cost effectiveness, I'd like to come back to Audrey's point about self-management. At the same time as you empower the individuals with living with pain, 
to um, become more motivated, to become more political, to raise their voice. At the same time, you can give them the capacity to have more flexibility in terms of managing their own condition and to go forward and to lobby and to work as a partner with their doctor in a self-managing way. Well, we are going to see you uh, in just a moment, actually. I'm going to ask you to come, come to the front uh, for, for the, uh, the, the next session because it's important we hear patient voices and it's important that we recognise this point that we can have all the data in the world, but narrative actually understanding what people are going through has a huge effect on all of us, doesn't it? Audrey, you wanted... I do think we have to be strategic. Um, and I think it's such a broad church. Um, there's so much, and as you said, it's almost incomprehensible for a politician who wants to make a difference. I really do think that if we are strategic and we take the issues that are germane, and maybe if we picked a few of them and identify them as key for the future. Maybe when we have this meeting next year, we could have a benchmark and see how have we done. Maybe, maybe a year is too short, but maybe we could say, like a school report, could do better or needs to improve here. Some sort of way of assessing, have we formed a strategic alliance sufficiently to prioritize the priorities? and that we can go to those who are ordering priorities, the policy makers, and say, this is important, can we align? And one of the things, I know Marion Harkin will be here later, but one of the things she said to us, which really I think is, is important for us to, to underscore and to underpin, she said, if we align ourselves with existing initiatives in the parliament, in the commission, and if we form uh, coalitions in that way, or alliances, as, as we've just heard, um, perhaps we can then be more effective. Because otherwise, if um, we're working in brain disorders, and we heard in the TED talk that you know, um, neuropathic pain is, comes from the brain and the plasticity and the changing, um, the change in, our, in the neurotransmitters. Well, if that is happening and we know it scientifically, then surely with this wonderful science, these tremendous people in this room who've dedicated their lives to advocating, and then politicians who want to make a difference, and surely we can do something that would be measurable and would encourage us. Can I just say, Marion Harkin is the MEP who perhaps more than anybody else has been leading in the European Parliament on this. She will be here later. I'm sure you're right, Audrey. I'm sure you're right, we need milestones. But I suspect you're not right in saying maybe a year is too short. If we aren't setting ourselves short-term goals, it'll drift. And I think that's exactly what we've got to do by the end of the day. I'm Cathy Price. I'm a consultant in Southampton, right in the um, county next door to Mehazin. Um, I just wanted to actually... Uh, I hope I've got enough time, really, because I've been watching all of Marison's work with a lot of interest. We're right next door. And thinking, how can we get this in, in, in Hampshire? Marison, you talked about 80 patients, finding 80 patients early on and then getting 35 in. Um, I'm wondering, what's it going to take for... And you may be able to tell me this by now because you've been running at it for a year and a half in Dorset to actually get that up to a you know, much larger scale. And then I just want a quick question up to Jamie. GPs run data queries all the time to case-find patients. Would that Could you help Merzen in any way? It's the last part again. Um, Merzins, um has a problem in finding patients. Yeah. Can you help in any way? Well, Merzins yeah. might want to answer first. Yeah. Move to Dorset for a start, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's the what point I made earlier about the diagnosis codes and things. It, it's There's no consensus when somebody walks through the door, whether they go down the chronic pain pathway or just, you know... So if we get yeah. consensus, can, yeah. would that help? Well, it's, it's key. It, so we do it in that, every other disease area. We're asking medicine? for a special, yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. Mahertz, and how can you scale yeah. your operation up? I think by thinking of education. And, you know, someone yeah. was saying earlier that vets get more pain trained than uh, medics do. I imagine that's because their patients bite harder. But uh, speaking kind of... <laughs> 
seriously about it, the fact is that if we actually had better pain education, we would have one pathway set out, whereas currently patients are sent to MSK services, they're sent to rheumatology, they're sent to many other avenues, so patients get lost in the system. Somebody mentioned, I think Chris, you mentioned system failure earlier, in terms of where patients, you know, journeys and patients' pathways don't go inside, and that's, you know, partially why people are lost from the system. Okay, just as we finish... The big priority for each of you, if you just had to say one thing to SIP that we, by next year, have got to focus on, the next 12 months, this is what we're going to throw our weight on, what would it be? Jamie, do you want to start? A consensus. We, Building a consensus. On what we're trying to do, because we've, we're, it's a fantastic alliance of a lot of great people with lots of great ideas. They're all very different. OK, so <laughs> yeah. we've got to decide. Yeah. We can't do everything at once. We've got to have a priority. That's probably very, very good advice. If we try and do ten things over the next year, we won't do any of them. If we try and do one thing, we might do it well. Orsi? Uh, for me, the point about building coalition that was raised in the audience and Audrey is a powerful one, because uh, there are so many common issues there that are really on the agenda today. Patient empowerment, self-management, multidisciplinary training, focusing on quantifications of the, of the costs and benefits of the um, intervention. And these are absolutely inherent to, to chronic pain management. We haven't talked about shifting care from institutions to community, but I think that's also a key issue on the agenda, and it's a key issue on the chronic pain agenda. So looking for broader coalitions and uh, using these as a sort of waves to, to surf ahead would be one uh, good strategy, I would so say. Am I right to interpret that as building what Jamie is saying? Have one priority, but then all of us get together as an alliance. No little groups going off doing their own thing and saying, this is going to be our priority, not your priority. We are going as SIP. We are going to go as one group, if we can, with one great priority for the year ahead. We can always have another priority for the following year, but we've got to do this together. Audrey. I'm delighted to tell you we have one. <laughs> and it's called Brain, Mind and Pain. And we're launching it um, with our colleagues in Pain Alliance Europe uh, in February in the Parliament. And one of the co-chairs is Marion Harkin, the MEP. And um, hopefully that's the alliance uh, that we've been talking about and trying to make a difference. We're building a book of evidence as we speak so that we're not just... Um, pretending to represent patients, this will actually be the lived experience of people. Mertz, and what would your priority be? I think mine would be an invitation to you to go away from the traditional models of working with pain. We've got the expertise, we know how to work with pain. Just think how quickly can we actually offer it? Because in every minute that we waste talking, literally, two people will move from acute to chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Yep, so in this 45 minutes, we've had, please do the maths, that many people, 90 people have already slipped from acute to chronic pain. So we can think policy, we can think big. Please also think of the services you're commissioning. Are we commissioning the right sort of pain service or do we need to put our goods far, far more you know, early in the patient's journey? Think big, think bold, it's time to act. Chris, it's time to act. What are you going to do? What do you think we should do? What is the one thing we should focus on? Well, I don't think it's me. I think the thing we should focus on is getting everybody seen at six weeks. That's been UK government policy for 20 years and they haven't done it. I can't do it. It's their policy. They should do it. That's what patients want. That's what doctors want. That's what we've heard is going to save a shed load of money. Why don't we do it? But if, if I get access and I get access to a general practitioner who has had Unlike the 18% uh, uh, that have had some formal training in pain, I'm one of the 82% that hasn't. Um, OK, you come and see me in six weeks, but I won't know what to do with you. Well, I th this is where the most disciplinary pain team, the physio teams, come in. There's one in Bolton, very near where I live. It's superb. It works. It helps people. It gets them back to work. But we don't replicate that throughout the UK. That's crazy. OK, well, what I think, what I take from that... Uh, uh, two things. One, we've all got to focus on one thing. Secondly, we've then all got to get behind it. Thirdly, we haven't yet decided what that one thing really ought to be. But we've two other panel sessions ago. We've got lunch to consider it all.